Let me introduce you to our first speaker of the morning. Sunita Gupta is an equity, diversity, and inclusion consultant with I2C Immigration Consulting. As an EDI consultant, Sunita identifies barriers to inclusion in the workplace and helps organizations move forward with a planful approach to drive measurable change in employee engagement, performance, and retention, enhancing the organizational culture. Sunita has been an active member in the Kingston community for the past 25 years. I'm sure you've heard of her. She is involved as a volunteer on several boards and committees, currently as the board director for the Greater Kingston Chamber of Commerce. She is a subcommittee member for the Mayor's Kingston Economic Recovery Team and other diversity and inclusion advisory committees. Sunita was the past president of the India Canada Association of Kingston and past board director for the Tet Center. She holds a certificate in leadership and inclusion from Centennial College and a certificate in ethics and contemporary social issues with a focus on immigration and integration from St. Paul's and, Univers and Ottawa Universities. She is also, as I mentioned, the co-founder of I2C Immigration Consulting. Welcome to the stage, Sunita. Good morning, everyone. Maybe I'll start off with a bit of an anecdote. My sister always does everything, and there's been times because if my brother-in-law finished drinking his tea or finished drinking, she would just take the cup. He just had to do this, and she would take the cup from him. And then <laughs> finally, years of like us talking to her, she kind of, it dawned on her that her hand does not have to appear under that cup automatically. And she stopped doing it. And there was like, he's like, his cup is dangling in the air. He's finished his chai and the hand has not appeared. But these are things that we need to remind ourselves, like, you know, check ourselves because we, we uphold those systems, those, you know, patriarchal, cultural, um, ways that we do things, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's on us to be the disruptor as well. So, I mean, when my daughter was born, she was born here, our, our first born in, in, in Canada, again, we're a short family. And the, you know those graphs, if anyone has, who's been a parent here, they have these graphs that they give you, the height and weight, and you're, this is your first child, and you're being a super diligent mom, and you're trying to check off all those things. Well, her weight was on the chart. She was a healthy eight pounds, two ounces, but her length was not there. Like we were off the charts in the other direction. And I was getting all concerned, it's a perfectly healthy baby. And until someone says, you know, those are meant for Caucasian uh, populations. These are not designed, these graphs are not there for, and, and obviously like, you know, we're short, both her parents were short. She wasn't gonna be anything, you know, six foot tall, there's no, it's not part of her genetic makeup. But these are the things, right? Systems are created in such a way that they're not equitable. And, and then when we are not matching up, we think we are lesser than. So just to sort of set the stage, I think my presentation is gonna be just more basic, a little bit talking about equity, diversity, inclusion, what that means, and then we'll get more into the gender equality part. But today my bit is just giving everyone that overview. I think it's important for us to recognize that this is a collective learning space we, um, we challenge the idea, not the person. So feel free to speak up, share what you think, and, and we all, it's on us to make sure that we allow that space for that individual if they want to share that uh, thought and not challenge the person. And then acknowledge that we are, uh, the, the feelings that we are working with, sometimes there's gonna be discomfort there. So it's again on us to acknowledge that. And um, step up or step back in the session as needed and respect confidentiality. What is diversity? And I'm not going to reread that definition that's up there. Uh, we all understand that diversity is gender diversity, whether it's cultural, religious, abilities, all of those things. But again, it's important to re uh, remember two things. Diversity is relational. Right now in this group, Mike, your diversity or gender diversity, right? Because this is, so we forget that oftentimes it's the setting and you know, in, in India, I am not, definitely not diversity in India. So that's one thing to remember. And the other thing is that it's not just about the identity of the person. With those identities comes their lived experience. And that is what diversity is about, is about those identities and about those experiences that that person has had as a bearer of that identity. So something for us to think about because we're so used to, again, looking at that box. So we're gonna do a little reflection on our uh, identity and lens. 
every time I read out this statement, we can, if we hold up our 10 fingers, and then if it applies to you, you can put a finger down. And this, this used to be what we call the privilege walk, where we were all lined up in a room, and you took a step forward if that um, statement applied to you. And then, you know, by the end of the exercise, that gap became very uh, visible. But again, in light of the space, and also the pandemic taught us how to switch some of these things. So if we can all hold up our 10 fingers, and uh, I'm going to read out the statement, and if it applies to you, put, put your uh, finger down. In school, I learned the history of my ancestors. This one for me, because I went to school in India, actually does not apply. Had I gone to school here, it would have applied to me. I have been followed around in stores suspected of shoplifting. My organization uses my mother tongue as its primary language for oral and written communication. I've had to skip a meal due to insufficient money to pay for groceries. The religious holidays observed by my employer match with my spiritual practices. I can express affection to my partner in public without attracting negative attention or hostile comments. I can comfortably access most buildings without needing accessibility accommodations. And we can also reflect here that accessibility goes beyond physical accessibility, so there could be more in terms of visual and whatnot. So if that applies, uh, the presence of law enforcement makes me feel safe and protected. I've had to sit by myself during recess at school. I have been treated poorly by a client who I'm, whom I'm trying to help due to the color of my skin. So yeah, I was able to have four, four fingers down. Like, I shouldn't say I was able to. I have four fingers down. But does this drive the point? I think that, again, our identities, our experiences really impact. And they can start at a very young age. That feeling of not being, uh, you know, when you're si no one comes and sits with you when you're sitting at recess. No one joins you. All those feelings of exclusion, and we'll talk about that. So uh, just something for us to always be mindful of when we're talking about equity, diversity, and inclusion. This is what we call um, social location and identity. So all those things that we talked about, you know, the first uh, definition about diversity that I shared, uh, along with it, it's, there's so much more to it, right? Like, uh, it, it, is, it is our uh, socioeconomic status, it is our political belief, all of those things together. So it's not, again, that visible identity, everything, all those cultural values, the religious values, political beliefs, all of those together form who we are and what our views are, how, we're, how we are received, perceived by others. So just something that, you know, for us to be mindful of at all times uh, when we're talking about identity and privilege. So this is another one. So it's called um, an identity um, iceberg. On the left side here, all these things that appear are typically, the, the analogy I give is if I'm standing in front of a mirror, what I would see about myself or what you see without knowing me today is what is this list here. And maybe some of those things also are not immediately um, apparent because uh, you wouldn't know what's my necessarily what my religion or my faith is if I don't share that with you. But typically, again, what we see of a person is what we see above the, that iceberg, above the waterline. And then there is things that are not that it visible. And those are class, socioeconomic status, educational background, mental learning abilities, sexual orientation. And as you can read, again, I don't have to go through that entire list. But these are important things. And what happens is when we interact with someone just based on this here, we're not making real connection. We're not, and whether it is building connection, whether it is creating those equitable spaces and workplaces in our communities, based on this, we are only just, again, it's the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to a person. And the more we get to know someone as a whole, we will realize there's so much more to connect on and with that person as opposed to just the superficial identities. Intersectionality, are most of you familiar with this term? intersectionality. Uh, okay, I get some thumbs up and some. Um, it is, again, I'm not going to read the, read the definition as you can read. It is a complex way of how our identities all intersect. I am not, like at one given time, not just a woman. 
Another time, I'm not just an Indian. I am an Indian woman or someone from India who practices Hinduism. I am all of that at all times. I'm also a Canadian citizen. I'm not compartmentalized. So that's what intersectionality means. And again, for those who, who are coming from backgrounds that are typically racialized or underrepresented, those intersectionalities together can then present so many disadvantages because it's not one thing. So this term was actually coined by Kimberly Crenshaw and um, it, ha it so happened that back in the day there was a lawsuit that uh, some black women filed against GM, the, the, the car company, the auto company. And their case was that GM wasn't hiring enough black women or they had let go of some black women. And GM's comeback was that we have women on our staff, we have black men on our staff, and that was the point that Kimberly Crenshaw was making was that that's one thing, you have men on your staff, uh, black men, and you have women, but you don't have black women on, and they are again. Now you've combined two uh, aspects of their identity, they're racialized and they're women. So again, they're further disadvantaged. And the way I like to explain the impact of these in intersectional identities sometimes for those of us who have um, you know, aspects of our identities that do disadvantage us is like the compound interest theory. The impact that they have over time is so much more than it's not a snapshot in their life. Like today you, you did not get to participate in something or you, you were looked over a project because of who you are because of your identity, but the impact that it has over time, because you continue to be overlooked for a project, you continue to be overlooked for other promotional opportunities, and you know, or in, in, in the community, you, you, you don't have access to all the, uh, the goods and resources. So these are not just snapshots. We have to understand these are experiences that folks continue to live with, and they continue to impact, and they have a much more deeper uh, effect on someone's life than, than we can sometimes see in, uh, and which, which is what I'm calling snapshots. In North America, what we see as the dominant group and the non-dominant group, typically again, it's the white settler, Christian, atheist, all of those things. And I, I was listening to a, a presentation a while back from Michael Bach, who's the CEO of Canadian Center for Diversity and Inclusion. And he uses the term SWAM, which is like almost like that top tier. It's straight, white, able-bodied male, and everything else that, it, that is not fitting in that is disadvantaged in some, some way or another. Lastly, so what is positionality? Uh, it's probably another term you, maybe some of you have come across, maybe you haven't, and it is how differences in social position and power shape our identities and access in society. So again, an experience walking to the bus stop could be very different for someone and we cannot say, oh, that's a safe area. I don't have an issue walking there to that bus stop. But then someone else, perhaps as a woman, I would say, I'm OK there. But maybe someone who presents as trans may not have that same experience as I would because of what's the demographic around there, what's the crowd. Super. Thank you. Thank you.